The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Our topic today, charting Egypt's political future. Nearly two years after a broad coalition of Egyptians took to the streets to end three decades of authoritarian rule by Hosni Mubarak, the nation's social and political environment remains turbulent. As a diverse group of actors vie for power in Egypt's post-revolutionary political space, the nation's long-term trajectory has yet to be definitively established. With an insider's analysis of who's who and where Egypt may be headed two years after the Tahrir Square uprising, we're pleased to be joined today by journalist, blogger, and activist Wael Abbas, author of Mr. Digital, one of Egypt's best-known blogs. His work to expose human rights abuses in Egypt has resulted in numerous awards and frequent attention on the part of the authorities. His recent honors include the Egyptians Against Corruption Award and Human Rights Watch Helman Hammett Award. He previously has been named one of the BBC's most influential people of the Middle East and Middle East Person of the Year by CNN. Well, Abbas, welcome to Milwaukee and to International Focus. Thank you. Well, I uh, wonder if you could help us to sort of set the context of the Egyptian revolution. We hear a lot of uh, news about the Arab Spring generally, as if it was sort of a, a broad, generic topic. Uh, were there commonalities in the, in the uprisings throughout the region? Um, the commonality is all our countries in the region suffer from dictatorship, uh, different kinds of dictatorship, sometimes military, sometimes civilian, sometimes a, a monarchy, a king or a prince or uh, religious uh, um, uh, ruler. Um, so people want to express themselves, they want to live their lives freely, they want to make their own choices in life, uh, they want no control over media, over education, uh, over uh, all the aspects of life. That's why people had to revolt in several countries uh, in the region. And uh, they were helped, of course, by the new factor of the presence of the internet and the social media platforms. Uh, that helped them uh, organize and campaign and uh, uh, communicate with each other, which is something that was denied to them by their own governments. And uh, what, what were the unique elements in Egypt's experience? Uh, Egypt's experience is um, um, a long one. It, it has been happening for years now. Uh, maybe dates back to 2003 or 2004, the political move, move, movement that is calling for change has been forming and fermenting and gaining momentum and making use of all the, uh, the media outlets available uh, uh, and the social media and the internet. Uh, Egypt, Egyptians, Egyptian bloggers were leader in we le were leaders in their field. They were the first, I claim, worldwide maybe to use blogs to post photos and videos of the events that are taking place in the country and to expose also uh, uh, corruption, election rigging, uh, torture and murder in police stations and prisons, police brutality. Uh, uh, all, all these these kind of stuff that were not available to the public before uh, that um, was shocking and the, the Egyptian experience in this field was followed by the bloggers all over the Arab world or even in Iran itself uh, in Tunisia in Lebanon in Saudi Arabia in Jordan in Morocco we've seen bloggers emerging and covering what's going on in their societies and trying to make a change uh, in these countries so you're saying at least in the Egyptian context 
these processes were going on before the dramatic events of Tahrir Square. Of course, of course. Uh, I personally have been blogging since 2004, and there was a movement called Kifaya, mm -hmm. which means enough, that was calling for Mubarak to be impeached and was warning against his son following him. And there was a 6th of April movement in 2008. So there was a lot of stuff happening in Egypt before the revolution in 2011. And uh, when, it, when it did finally boil over into uh, what we saw in Tahrir Square, tell us a little bit about who made up the opposition, what, what kinds of groups? The opposition consisted of lots and lots of factions and people from different backgrounds, liberals, socialists, anarchists, uh, even Islamists. Uh, people who had no political background at all, people who never practiced politics in their lives, but they were angry at Mubarak's regime and angry at the deteriorating uh, economical conditions in Egypt. Uh, uh, people from the uh, workers' unions, syndicates, uh, journalists, uh, people who are working in the fields of education, uh, doctors. Uh, Anybody who felt the injustice or that the country is going the wrong way was there in Tahrir Square protesting and demanding Mubarak to be removed. And, uh, you know, we were chatting a bit earlier. One of the things that has differentiated many of these movements is typically there isn't a single opposition figure, as, as we've seen in some other movements. So how, how did that come to be? Well, the, the main thing here is the idea. Uh, as I told you, uh, the, the, the idea has become the leader. The idea of leadership, in, in my opinion, has become something from the 60s. Uh, it is not uh, the important thing anymore. So, so you, you no longer need an, an iconic figure? No, I, I believe most of the recent revolutions that have we have witnessed, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the uh, uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain, the countries of, of Eastern Europe, South America, Southeast Asia, all the, the changes and the revolutions that took place in these countries had no leaders. It was only people's movements, students' movements, uh, who were seeking after uh, a, a specific idea, which is freedom or stuff like that. And uh, the change happened, although there was no real leader present that we can name. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we saw pre-revolutionary Egypt was there, there really was no space for much organized groups outside the mosque. So uh, the Muslim Brotherhood had an organization. Do you think that accounts for Mr. Morsi ultimately prevailing as president? Well, the, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood is one of the biggest or maybe the biggest organization, political organization in Egypt, and they have been organized since the 70s, uh, and although they have suffered during the 50s and the 60s uh, under Nasser, and they were murdered and put to prison and tortured and stuff like that, and even under Mubarak, they were denied political rights, um, they were denied uh, participating in parliament and stuff like that. But we cannot say that they are the biggest in the country or the, uh, the, the ones that should come to power because they, they represent a small portion of the political spectrum in Egypt. And as you've seen during the presidential elections, Morsi won by a small margin and this he has to he had to be helped by the liberals and the socialists and the revolutionaries who believed that the revolution should win and uh, Ahmad Shafi from the former regime should never win so they just voted for Morsi just to oppose uh, Ahmed the winning of Ahmad Shafi so uh, if if the Muslim Brotherhood was that big he would have won with a large margin but this didn't happen. He needed the others. So uh, walk us through really sort of what happened after Mubarak fell. Uh, there were sort of phases in, in the revolution since then. So tell us a little bit how that Well, after, after Mubarak fell, there was a, a, a feeling of huge achievement by most, most of the revolutionaries that they left the square and they decided to organize themselves in political parties or political organizations uh, and uh, try to participate in the political life 
uh, run for parliament or something like that. But personally, I believe that we should remain, we should have remained in the square and we should have written our uh, revolution's constitution in the square and we should have not le uh, left the square under any circumstances. But the military uh, had another opinion, of course, uh, since they have lost lots of political and uh, economical interests in the country. So they ev evacuated the, the square by force killing and imprisoning and putting lots of activists on trial. We have been fighting uh, them for almost a year and a half uh, until the presidential elections. And uh, we have seen a, a, a constitutional declaration uh, that was made by them uh, enforcing their power over the country. And they were supported, unfortunately, by, by our allies, the Islamists, the Salafis, and the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were helped uh, by them in oppressing the opposition and oppressing the media. And we've had a parliament consisting mainly of Islamists. Uh, and their uh, 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 performance was not satisfactory to the Egyptian public until it was dissolved. Uh, so the Egyptians realized that the Islamists are not the answer. And this was obvious in the presidential elections, uh, which has made Morsi win by the votes of both the Islamists and the liberals and the socialists. Not only the Islamists were not enough to make him win, and the people who are sympathetic with the Islamists have uh, decreased after they have seen the poor performance of the Islamists in the parliament. So they were not convinced that the Islamists are the fit to run the country. So one of the, the critical issues now is the drafting of the constitution that you referenced. And, and tell us a little bit about that process and where it is. Uh, we've had uh, several committees uh, writing the constitution in Egypt. The first one was dissolved. The second one we have now is main, consists mainly of Islamists and uh, most of uh, the uh, the liberals and uh, the secular uh, and the, the the christian members have withdrawn from uh, from the committee which renders it illegal uh, now uh, the uh, constitution uh, was responsible for uh, um, recommending uh, very controversial articles uh, concerning uh, children's rights and women's rights and uh, minorities' rights and human rights in general, and uh, general freedoms. Uh, so it wasn't liked by a lot of Egyptians, and it doesn't really represent the Egyptian population and doesn't, uh, of course, represent the demands of the revolution that demanded freedom above air, anything else. And now Morsi has issued a declaration a few days ago uh, making it untouchable, although it is illegal now because of the withdrawal of the uh, uh, secular elements uh, from it, but he has made it uh, powerful and cannot be dissolved even by a court order. Right. And uh, I'd like to, to talk a little further about that decree, but we're going to take a short break first. We'll be right back with more. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking with Wael Abbas, Egyptian blogger, journalist, and activist, and uh, looking at the political future of his country. Well, uh, before the break, we were talking about the most recent uh, moves by President Morsi uh, regarding his power and, and the formation of the Constitution. So let's continue with that. Well, as I said, Morsi a few days ago issued a decree uh, or a constitutional declaration too, 
he claimed that it aims at protecting the revolution and it aims at putting the members of the old regime on trial again because the trials uh, the previous trials were not satisfactory and he said that uh, this uh, declaration is going to give uh, uh, the families of the marchers and the injured uh, more rights than they had after the revolution but uh, on 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 another note the uh, the the, the uh, declaration has made him more powerful it made him acquire the uh, 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 judiciary power besides the uh, uh, legislative and the executive, executive powers that he already has in his hands because we have no parliament at, at the moment, which renders him, him almost a dictator. Also, he, uh, uh, the, the declaration says that his uh, decisions and decrees are, cannot be touched by courts of law. Uh, which is ridiculous, especially uh, in, 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 in a country that is after a revolution. Uh, so nobody can ask him questions, uh, he can do whatever he wants, uh, no, nobody can dissolve the Constitutional Committee, um, so he's basically a dictator, so it's not acceptable after, uh, at all in Egypt. So uh, his position has been that these are temporary powers that he will relinquish once the Constitution is in place. And other people have said, in the same way that uh, during virtually the entire Mubarak regime, the emergency laws were in place, which ostensibly were to be temporary. Is this, uh, in your opinion, sort of the, the new version I, I, of the I emergency cannot, law? I, it, it, it includes an emergency law, actually, that that is more vicious than the law that was during Mubarak. And they claim that this law is to protect the revolution. I cannot trust them. I cannot uh, believe them because they have lied to us before. The Muslim Brotherhood and Freedom and Justice Party and Morsi, uh, after, the, after the revolution, they said we're not going to run for the majority in the parliament. And they ran for the majority in the parliament. And then they said we're not going to nominate somebody for the president. But then they nominated somebody for the president and they won the presidential elections. So they are not to be trusted. They didn't help us when we were fighting with the military, with the SCAF. Uh, they denied the, our accusations uh, uh, of the military of murdering the people in the protests in the streets. Uh, so why should we believe that the, uh, these powers are well, going to be temporarily in their hands. Gamal Abdel Nasser in the early 50s said that uh, these temporary powers are going to be in his hands. And we remained under a military rule for, rule for 60 years. And uh, finally we got rid of it. So we're not going to welcome another kind of dictatorship, a religious dictatorship. Well, uh, you know, certainly many people secular and, and on the right in the old regime have long warned, correctly or incorrectly, that uh, that any sort of Islamist movement is likely to use democracy and the democratic process much much like a, a bus where you ride it to your stop and then dispense with it. Do you think that's what's happening here, or or other people have suggested perhaps there's something in the system that allows people, once they've achieved the, the presidential power, to, to just grab that kind of power, irrespective of their ideology. Which do you think? Well, I, I was one of those people who warned against Islamists taking over, because, because it is something that can be understood in our region with, with a population mainly conservative and religious by nature, even if they are not really practicing, but they, 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 they like to resort uh, to the uh, religious element in their life. So they will automatically vote for anybody who is claiming that he is representing Islam, especially if they are as organized as the Muslim Brotherhood. But uh, after a revolution and uh, writing a constitution, we can control these things. We can uh, make sure that nobody is in power permanently because we've suffered uh, under Mubarak because of that. 
And also, it, as I told you previously, the, the performance, the poor performance of the uh, Islamists in the parliament convinced the people that the Islamists are not the right choice. They, they have already made the right, the, 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 their choice in the first parliamentary elections, in the parliament that was dissolved. And uh, I, I think and I hope that the Egyptians will not make the same mistakes after they've seen that the, those people that they have chosen and who have fooled them using the, uh, religion uh, ha were not performing satisfactorily in, in the parliament. And, uh, you know, in, in this country, we've just gone through an election, of course, and, and much was uh, written and, and discussed about the ground game of the various political parties. It's like, how uh, extensive was their organization? How effectively they were able to mobilize? Can anyone at this point rival the, the Muslim Brotherhood's just organization on the ground? Not one organization, but Tahrir Square can do that. And as we've seen in the last few days, millions have taken to the streets, not only to Tahrir Square, but in many other cities all over Egypt, in Damanhur, in Alexandria, in Suez, in Asyut, in Port Said, in many cities. And there were even violence. Some of the headquarters of the Muslim Brotherhood were torched. Um, we have lost two people during the, the last events. So people are fiercely angry and uh, against the, uh, the, the decrees of uh, Morsi and they are willing to change it and they are not accepting uh, that uh, we in reinstate, uh, we, we, we put a, a new uh, dictator uh, to run this country. Well, let's talk a little bit about sort of the wider geopolitical context in which this is taking place. You know, uh, President Morsi was seen as being effective in, in brokering the, the truce recently with uh, events in Gaza. And shortly after that, he makes these decrees. Is, is there any connection between those events, do you think? Not really, because there were some people who were also trying to draw a connection between Hillary Clinton's visit to Egypt and Morsi's decree. Like, was there something under the table that we didn't know about? But the Egyptians in general, they, they sympathize with the Palestinians. They like Gaza. They want the situation in Gaza to improve. But Morsi have been always accused by the Egyptians of being the president of Gaza rather than Egypt. He's sending them uh, uh, fuel, uh, gas, uh, electricity. Uh, while we are suffering inside Egypt, lack of fuel and lack of electricity, electricity power cuts all the time and uh, sending uh, 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 medical aid and stuff like that. Although the, our hospitals are miserable and miserable and the doctors are on strike at the moment as we speak. Um, so uh, Egyptians besides was Gaza, but uh, they are not really happy with Morsi's involvement in the Gaza issue more than he is involved in the Egyptian issue. We've had even a comment from a German minister uh, to Morsi telling him that you should take care of your own people as you take care of the people of Gaza or something. Well, you referenced uh, Hillary Clinton's visit. What is the perception on the street? of the American administration's handling of, of relations with Egypt throughout this process? Well, there are rumors both in Egypt and here in the United States about a relationship between the Obama administration and the Muslim Brotherhood. And there were accusations of the Obama administration funding the Muslim Brotherhood and helping them win the elections and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, um, I cannot confirm or say that I believe any any of this, but I believe that the American administration, whoever they are, uh, Republicans or Democrats, they have interests in the region and they want to preserve these interests and they want to be in good terms with whoever is running Egypt in order to uh, protect these interests, military, economical, and uh, to keep the peace with Israel, of course. So uh, uh, I, I, that's what I believe about the relationship between the American administration 
and uh, Morsi's administration. But I hope that the uh, refrain from doing what they used to do was Mubarak, supporting a dictator against his own people, because I believe that the people, we are the ones who make the decisions, not any president who's running the country. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll leave you with a final question. What, if anything, is, is the most constructive role the U.S. and the West more generally can play in this process in Egypt? As, as I just said, <laughs> refrain from uh, supporting a dictator if Morsi is going to become a dictator in Egypt just to protect the American interests because the interests of the Americans lie with the Egyptians themselves, not with whoever is running the country because the ruler can be removed any time like we removed Mubarak. Very good. Well, we'll leave it at that. It's certainly a fascinating story we'll need to keep an eye on. To our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 